This morning, if you haven't already, we need you to ask, ask you to take out your Bible and turn with me to Titus 1 and take out your outline. If you don't have an outline, please just lift your hand and these kind gentlemen will get one to you. You really do need one. If you're new to us this morning, this sermon will lose you if you don't have the outline, I promise. You'll need it this morning. And this morning we have a, uh, a very, very interesting word that's part of our title. And uh, as part of our title, I have somebody to help me understand this. Now, last Sunday, we looked at this picture of biblical eldership. We finished a series within a series in our study of um, Titus. Look with me at Titus chapter 1 and verses 1 through, through 9. We've been looking at what type of leaders need to be a part of the church. But this morning we come to um, an interesting concept that we see throughout God's Word. And it's important that we have an orientation on it. And I've entitled this, The Serrated Edge of God's Truth. And um, this morning I have asked um, one of my good friends, George Ramos, to come help me. So George, go ahead and come on up. And Marcy, if you can help me for just a second. I am excited. Now, w this morning we're not observing the Lord's Supper. And in fact, we have something very, very different. Um, as part of this, and uh, I, uh, we do have bread here on the table, but come on up here with me, George, for just a moment. Now, some of you can't quite see what is here yet, but you're going to in just a moment. This morning, George is going to help us understand what a serrated edge is and what it means. George is a chef. He is a five-star chef. Uh, he uh, came from Cuba. He married his wonderful wife. I said Cuba. Sorry, I know that. Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't punch me. Puerto Rico. He married his wonderful, <laughs> married his wonderful wife, Barbara. His wife, Barbara, is on staff with us. She's our human resources uh, for both the school and the church. And George, um, father of three and uh, chef. So he spends his time over on uh, the beach, over on Miami Beach, cooking beautiful, wonderful meals. He's trained for this. He lives in this. And I've asked him, George, what is a serrated edge? And so um, he's going to help us a little bit. Look at the screen, if you would, for just a moment, and look at the knife. Now, George, this is a knife. And I, you've made such a big deal to me about what knives are how important knives are. And you know what? I'm realizing that we need a microphone for you, and so I'm going to use this one right here. George, why is a knife so important to a chef? So, it's, it's on. Okay. He's got it. So, for, for us chefs, it's, it's our tools. It's what we use day to day. So, I would compare that to the tools a doctor would use in surgery or a soldier would use in combat. So, that's why they're so important for us. Um, without them, we wouldn't be able to do our job. Now, you sent me this image, and tell us what this image is. So, this image is one of the earliest images that was publicized in a book, and it's from an Italian master chef, uh, Bartolomeo Scappi, and he um, published a book called Opera in 1570. It was the first time when a chef or um, in a cookbook, per se, uh, we saw the tools of a chef. And if you actually notice there, there is no serrated um, knives that came uh, almost uh, 400 years later. So 400 years later, this idea of serrated edge came. You also sent me this. You wanted us to kind of look from one to 10, kind of yeah. what this looks like so a little bit. These knives that are up there are some of the knives that we have down here. Um, and they all have a unique purpose. So if, if I start at number one, si something simple as a paring knife that could be used to clean vegetables it's or- It's like this yep, guy right here. Or uh, cut small fruits, if you will. Uh, number two being a uh, utility knife, something uh, that all purpose. So something a, like these two? Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that one would be a boning knife, so good to uh, butcher down chicken or fish. Uh, we have a slicing knife, which uh, you use to, uh, I guess, uh, also butcher fish and get thin slices of uh, protein. Uh, a cleaver, so to- That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've always been impressed with that. My mother never had one of those in the house because I lived in the house. So 
Um, but anyways, I've so always a, wanted to hold one of these. I've never held one so before have, that. It's, it's quite heavy. It'll it is heavy. It's very heavy. Cut through bone and some cartilage. Um, bone. We're butchering wow. down certain things. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, a chef knife. This one specifically a Santuco, and this is just a larger version. They come in different sizes. This is something that you can use for everything. Um, and then a honing steel. All these straight edge knives need a honing steel to make sure that the edge stays sharp. It's not a sharpener, we would use a whetstone, but it, it allows you to hone the, the steel. Now these are available from Walmart. You got these from Walmart? I did not, but yes. They, the, they you, you did not get these from no. Walmart. Like, these are like really nice ones, right? Uh, yes. So they're like five bucks or six or seven bucks, <laughs> something like that? A little, a little bit more than that. A little bit more than that. Yes. One knife set with this name, I saw uh, maybe three or four thousand bucks. I, I don't know. I mean, I I know that they have different ones, so but this, it's unbelievable. This actually is a set. There's a couple of knives missing that there are in my knife bag, but yes, they could be very expensive. But it, it just goes with different types of knives. They all yes. use different types of steel. This specific knives are, are dipped in titanium after they've been um, pounded out, but it's all preference. And as as years of experience, you kind of uh, grow favoritism to a type of knife, and these are some of my favorite knives. I have yeah. two different knife kits, so. So, like, I carry my computer and my Bible to and from the office. Mm -hmm. You carry your knives to They're and from always, the office. I always have a knife row in my car, and I have one in the office. So. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the, now you're starting to get an idea how important this is. All right, so talk to us about the serrated edge, and what does this mean? So this would be a serrated edge, right? This is uh, one of the bread knives that I have, and the bigger difference between these two knives, a straight edge and a serrated, um, the straight edge, it's one sharp blade that allows you to have one point if you're cutting a bread or a vegetable, versus the serrated, every few millimeters, it has these scalloped edges or indentations or teeth, if you will, that allow it to have different pressure points on the specific thing that we might be cutting or um, breaking down, which allows for a quicker, um, precise cut. Not always cleaner than a straight edge, but depending on the item that you are cutting or that we're breaking down, it is it gets a, a through clean it. cut and it does get through it. So you wanted to kind of show them the difference of a straight edge and, a, and uh, yeah. the other one on right. this. Right, so if, if I was to just cut, try to cut the bread, the straight edge may cut it, right? But there is some type of difficulty there, right? Uh, with the serrated, I could apply less pressure and get the same job done quicker. Um, and that's just one example. If uh, you know, we were to use it with vegetables, it would be the same thing or with different types of things. But I felt that bread would be one of those things that we typically do not use a straight edge. We do use a serrated or a bread knife, if you will. So the more serrated it is, like we see in this image, and it's, and it's going through the bread for slicing materials that have a very tough outside right. to them. Correct. Uh, and, and you explained that each one of those grooves allow there to be a, a, an amount of pressure Correct. and a better angle yes. um, just in the smallest way for that. Yes. Would you all say thank you to uh, George for this? Thank you, brother. Thank you. I, there's a reason that I ask him to share this with us, and it's because when we, when we look at this, it's not only in knives that we might see this, but it, it also might be in instruments of battle. I mean, think about this large, typical straight-edge sword. In fact, we often think of weapons of, of warfare with a straight-edge sword um, in this. But did you know that many, many swords through the centuries, through the millennia, have been made that are serrated? And I want you to kind of imagine this sword going into battle and think about what that would do on a battlefield. Maybe a Roman soldier has on a leather piece, uh, a leather garment. He he doesn't have chain mail. He doesn't necessarily have armor everywhere. Maybe his legs are exposed. Maybe, maybe he has leather covering his legs as opposed to armor. And to get through the leather, to get to the flesh, 
You have to have that serrated edge that allows each one of those dips to have different pressure or more intense pressure and then a better angle of attack as it goes into the leather and making its way into the flesh for damage. How about this sword? Imagine that. It almost looks like gears on it. Or a sword here that's almost 2,000 years old. A sword that would have an angle again that would be wielded in order to cut and to dice and to wreak havoc, as you can see that is there. Let me just say to you that part of God's truth has a serrated edge. This is not a very popular view of all things God in religion. In fact, the more we go into the future, that as we have seen in the last hundred years or so, we like a very tame view of God. We like a very tame view of His plan and His truth, and we like a rather innocuous view of that. We, we like a, a soft view, a, a very supportive and encouraging view. We, we, we don't really often think. In fact, how many times have you been reading through a section of Scripture, or maybe you you kind of, you've turned back to the Bible a little bit, and you started reading somewhere, and and boy, you're reading it, and you go, "Eh, this seems kind of rough. I want something encouraging. And you leave the text that may seem kind of rough, perhaps from the Old Testament or even the New Testament, and then you look for something that sounds sweeter and softer. Well, when we do that, we are missing out on the whole picture and the whole counsel of God's Word. And Titus doesn't let us get away with that. And so this morning, I want us to see the context. If you have your Bible um, open and if you have your outline there, you're going to need it. Notice here with me the context. If you're new to us this morning, I, I know Mrs. Tinknell is here. I know that others, Carol is here for the first time. Some of you are new to us this morning. I just want you to see where we are in this, and it'll make so much more sense to you. We're reading and we're studying this book of Titus where the Apostle Paul has left Titus on the island of Crete, and this is very important. We're going to see why this is important, in fact, toward the end of the message. Why, he's left Titus on the island of Crete to straighten out what? Messed up, messed up churches. Underline that. Straighten out messed up churches. And so that's, that's part of why they are there. He, he, is, he has left them there. And what are their problems? The thing that we've first been studying is the churches have problematic leaders. Not only pro- problematic leaders, but what's the next word there? Problematic doctrine, that means their beliefs are off. And then we see here their behavior is off. They're not acting like God's people. They're acting like the world. And so these churches are in this condition, and Titus is there to straighten it out. And this letter is telling him how to do that and what to do. Now, it's very interesting. If you have your Bible open, you're looking there at Titus. And in, in, in the very first part of Titus chapter 1, we see an introduction, and then we see what the leaders are to be. And so the very first thing, as he's dealing with this issue of problematic leader, he describes for them what godly, and you can fill that in, he's describing for them what godly leaders or teachers should have, what what kind of leaders they should have. They should be godly leaders. But then, after we, we've studied that for the last several weeks, is what a pastor, what an elder that is a biblically qualified elder looks like, now we come to see the problem. Now we see why he told Titus what to look for, because they have leaders that are a real problem. And that's what we're going to see now, is the ungodly leaders and teachers that they presently have. Now, George is just really beautifully and very vividly shared with us this idea of a serrated edge. And fill it in, it's an edge that has a, it's a jagged edge. If you look at the dictionary, it describes it as a jagged edge or even uses the word saw-like. It's like a saw. And that saw does and does its work by this. And you see the next line that is there. The teeth 
intensify the cutting pressure, so that's the pounds per square inch, um, or pounds per square millimeter on this, and it increases the angle of attack, so it really gets in and deals with it. And why do we need that? It's for cutting through, fill it in, tough or hardened material. It's for cutting through tough or hardened material. Okay, so when we talk about God's Word having a serrated edge, here's part of the picture. God's Word comes and deals with tough and hardened material in hardened hearts and a hardened world that is against Him. You see, if all of the Scripture was just rainbows and unicorns, and if we just had nice, soft, platitudes that deal with our sinful problem, we would go through this life and die still in our sin. This is the nature of a fallen world, and it's the nature of our carnal flesh. It is the nature of our hearts that have been hardened against God. And so God, listen to this, in His wisdom, and listen, in His grace, He cuts through the hardened world in which we live. He cuts through the hardened heart in which we have, and He shows us how serious He is, and not only how serious He is, but how serious our situation is. We come to realize by the dramatic nature of his cutting edge that we are in our sin and separated from him. We see it in the Old Testament. In his work, there's often much of his work is a serrated edge. But we also see it in the New Testament that not only as they deal with fallen leaders or as the descriptions are made of the human heart, theologically speaking, explained and and broken down in the New Testament, we see very often it is in very sharp and stark terms, terms. Now, perhaps the one that would show us this more than anyone else is the Lord Jesus. If you go back and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the words of Jesus, there are some times when he looks at the crowd and he says, oh, little lambs, come to me. I mean, he, you know, bring the children unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. There's very, you know, that we, that we see this great grandeur of God being described as, a, uh, as, as one who gathers, a hen that gathers his chicks and holds them and protects them. And then this very soft, but there's also times when he says, you brood of vipers. He looks right at them in their face, and he describes for them their problem. And he doesn't hold back words. He describes very clearly with a serrated edge what they need to hear in their their condition. So this morning as we read this passage for the first time, together, um, and as part of this study, I want us to see the serrated edge, and I want you to see it with me, and then we're going to blast through and look at how God uses serrated edge truth in the Word of God, and then we're going to look at a couple of verses and break them down, and then we'll be finished. But notice here with me the serrated edge of God's truth as seen in Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, and everybody look in the box on the page or in your Bible. Look at the box on the page, verse 10. For there are many, now remember, he's just dealt with the qualifications of elders. He's just dealt with these are the kind of leaders you need to have. And then he says in verse 10, here's the reason, for, he says, you need those godly leaders because there are many, circle the word many, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Just right out there to the side, a generalization. He's making a generalization. You see, this is harsh. We don't like generalizations. Generalizations are bad. Don't paint everybody with one brush. I mean, we, 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 in our society today, we, we, and there's some, there's some wonderful truth to that, but we see through the words of Jesus, and we see through the words of Paul, and we see through the words of the Bible that sometimes a generalization is correct. Notice here with me in verse 11. 
They must be what? Silenced. Since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Verse 13, the testimony is true. (laughs) Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Look at that word, sharply. We've just been talking about the edge. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. You see, there's a reason for it. Verse 14, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the, to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Verse 16, this is so biting. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Now, does that sound rather direct? I mean, look at the list of three things at the end in verse 16, and look at the list of three things at the beginning in verse 10. I mean, he is not holding anything back. He said, the leaders in your churches are this. This is what you've got, and this is why your churches are messed up. So after showing them what they need, he, with a very jagged, cutting edge, goes to show them what they have and why it's wrong. So as we, as we just kind of now have seen an example of serrated edge truth, I want you to notice a few things about serrated edge, and this can be throughout the Bible we begin to see it. First of all, the serrated edge of God's truth is at times directed toward God's enemies. It is part of the declaration, perhaps, of their condemnation. It is the description of their behavior and why it is wrong. The serrated edge comes after God's enemies. But it also is sometimes directed toward God's people. Both of us get the serrated edge. Um, Both the enemies of God and the people of God, so that we may see the importance of what he is saying. Now, notice this as we think about this. It is sometimes in the form of direct allegation. Sometimes the serrated serrated edge is in the form of direct allegation. There's other times when it is in the form of satire. And those are some of the most interesting um, portions that are there. I I, I don't want to miss this, though. i got to show you the, the direct allegation um, that, is, that is here. I mean, you, you just think about it with the life of the Lord Jesus. Numerous times he goes after what people are doing and he calls them out in front of everyone. But then when, he goes, when we go to satire, numerous times we see this. Now, in Isaiah chapter 44, you know, satire is very often when you say one thing, but you mean the exact opposite. And so you're lifting up this, as you're saying this, but the exact opposite of what you're saying is true, and everyone knows it. That's what satire often is. It's pointing out in a ridiculous manner a statement that is here. God uses satire in his word. Um, Also, we see the idea that sometimes it's in the form of comparison, a brutal comparison very often. In fact, I want you to see this on the screen in front of you. Our Lord Jesus, remember I said Lord Jesus uses the serrated edge at various times. Look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 25 through 28 on the screen. It says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. And what does he say? hypocrites. Now, that's the direct allegation. But look at the next part. For you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but instead they are full of greed and self-indulgence. He's saying, you religious leaders are actually greedy and you're living in the flesh while you proclaim to be righteous. You proclaim to be holy. You proclaim to uphold God's standard, but really... Behind it all, you actually use that position for your own greed and your own self-indulgence. Look at verse 26. You blind Pharisee, 
First clean the inside of the cup and plate that the outside may also may be clean. Now, you, Jesus uses comparison here. He's showing this. Look at verse 27. He goes at it again right, right away. Very next statement. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. That means rotting flesh. He's saying you appear very religious. You appear very righteous on the outside. You have your white on, because that's what the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would wear, these beautiful white robes. They would have gold uh, embroidering on them. I mean, it was quite a sight. And so here he says, you look like a beautiful whitewashed tomb. The inside has ro rotting um, and putrid signs of death. Look at verse 28. So you are out with, so also out, outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of what? Hypocrisy and lawlessness. So your heart is not governed by the authority of God. So Jesus, I mean, I, I'm sorry, but Jesus uses the serrated edge on those guys. I mean, and, and, and we see it over and over and over again. Um, there's many, many examples that we could use from this. But look at the next one that is here. Not only comparison, but it's sometimes in the form of sarcasm. Sometimes in the form of sarcasm, we see that in John chapter 10, verse 31 and 32. I mean, we, we see even Jesus use a sarcastic tone so that they start to see the error of their ways. It is often, so that those are sometimes, it is often harsh. I mean, there's not very many sweet serrated edges. It is often harsh, and sometimes even humorous. Sometimes it's humorous. Now, I want you to see this one, and for those of you who are students of the Bible, you remember um, in 1 Kings um, that Elijah goes, and he goes, and he has a big showdown with the prophets of Baal. If you've never read 1 Kings before, it is fantastic. I would encourage you to go read it this afternoon, and it, it is a beautiful display of the foolishness of worshiping uh, not other gods, or the foolishness of worshiping anything that is not the one true God, and the beautiful power and the glory of God. So this one prophet called Elijah is against 450 prophets of Baal. So this one prophet, he says, I'll tell you what, let's set up an altar, and um, we'll put a bull on top. We get two bulls. You get a bull, I get a bull. We put a bull on top of the altar, and we will call down fire from heaven. You've heard that phrase before. This is where it comes from, 1 Kings chapter 18. And it says, you call on your God, and I will call on my God. You call on Baal, I call upon the one true God of the universe. And, and we'll see who consumes this altar. So indeed, he says, and you can go first. And so there they are. They set up their altar. They put their bull on top of it. And they start calling out and calling out. They pray and they chant and they beg and they yell and they scream all the way from daybreak to noon. They're not getting anywhere with it. They start cutting themselves. They're, they're doing all kinds of of self-harm in order to call upon Baal to do this, and nothing has happened, nothing has happened, nothing has happened. And what does he say, Elijah, around noon, look at this, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 27, if this isn't the serrated edge, I don't know what is, and it's a bit humorous. He says, at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he is a god, he is, e perhaps he is, the idea is, he is either thinking or he's relieving himself or he is on a journey, perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. I mean, he's, he's mocking the foolishness of calling out to a God that is not there. And of course, nothing happens in their process of that. And uh, you know what, I'm not gonna tell you what happens uh, at the end of 
1 Kings chapter 18. Go read it for yourself about what happens next. It is glorious. So, so sometimes it's harsh and sometimes it's humorous. But here's what it is. It's always cutting. The serrated edge is always cutting. And I want you to, don't turn the page over yet, I want you to see these two passages of Scripture. You need to mark these. But notice on the screen in front of you, Isaiah chapter 49 and verses 1 through 3. Isaiah writes this, and look at the screen, listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, O distant peoples. The Lord God called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. He made my mouth like a what? A sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me like a polished arrow. He hid me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will display my glory. So you see, the serrated edge is part of what shows God's glory. It's not just being harsh to be harsh. It's not just being mean to to be mean. It's coming and it's showing God's glory when we begin to cut through the fallenness and the sin of our world in our own hearts. And so this serrated edge has a purpose. It displays its glory. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11 through 13. Now we skip to the New Testament to a Jewish audience. And in verse four, chapter 4 and verse 11 it says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Verse 12. For the word of God is what? Living and active, and here it is again, sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, that's parts of the body, in discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Look at verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So so don't miss this about the serrated edge. The serrated edge of God's rebuke, the serrated edge of the clarity of our condition as, as whether Old Testament or New Testament, we begin to see that it is God's grace that shows us sometimes through what seems to be harsh and what seems to hurt and indeed does hurt that he is revealing his glory. Now, flip your sheet over. Safe to do that at this point. I want you to see this passage again. We notice that the serrated edge it, it's a slash that is exposing, fill it in, the many ungodly leaders and teachers that are there. I've already had you circle that on the front side. Circle it again on the back side. In verse 10 it says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. In fact, it was in every church that there was a problem that they didn't have the proper leaders. Now, the first thing that we just want to look at for a couple of minutes this morning, and then over the next little bit as we continue and come back to this study, we'll see other things. But the first thing I want you to notice here is that we see their ungodly character. You remember that the qualifications, they all begin with who a man is before it tells what he must be able to do or what he is to do. You see, being is more important than doing when it comes to leadership. Now, you got to do. A leader's got to work. He's got he's to get the job done. He's got he's to lead. But he doesn't have the right to lead if he's not first what he is supposed to be before God and before man. And so here we see their ungodly character. 
And this is the first thing that Titus is, that Paul is pointing out to Titus, is that the reason that these guys are unqualified to lead is because their character is wrong. And it's very interesting, the first one that you see there, the word insubordinate. I remember as a child, I got in trouble in about the third or fourth grade, and I remember I did not know what the word insubordinate was when it showed up on my report card. And my dad had to explain it to me. Insubordination. I couldn't even, I couldn't even pronounce it at the time. But I remember sitting with him in his study as he drew me close to himself, and he said, let me explain to you what this means. As I began to see that, that I was accused of being insubordinate. You see, I was being accused of not being under authority. Fill that in. And that's the cry of every carnal human heart. I don't want to be under authority. I want to be my own king. I want to be my own ruler. I want to, you know, I want to do what I want to do. I want to be faithful to me. And that is that is certainly the cry of the unregenerate, unregenerate um, heart. But it's even after we come to faith in Jesus that we can still deal with insubordination. The other word that is there that I think I left on the, the sheet for you is rebellious. That these men who are, who are seeking to lead are simply rebellious. They're not under submission to God. So how in the world can they lead God's people? So the first thing is that they're insubordinate. The second thing is they are empty talkers. You know, the idea here is that they have many words with no substance. And there's no, there's no real bite to what they say. There's no real truth to what they say. In fact, it's a lot of fluff. Now, I, I tell you that that was a problem on Crete. And that is a problem today all over the world in people that call themselves Christians in churches. Whether it's part of the high church intelligentsia that you hear a nice message with platitudes, no one's feathers are ruffled, no one really understands what was being said, or it was a, you know, a moralistic, therapeutic deism of, you know, you need to be a good person, and being a good person has benefits, and that really is what it's all about. Just love each other and be good to one another, and it will come around. You know, I mean, we start, we, we, we start to see that the moralistic teaching that, that really doesn't ruffle any feather, feathers, but that is just calling people to be better people is, is really a lot of fluff. And either it's just seeking behavior modification or it's seeking some type of internal self-affirmation as opposed to saying, what does God say? What does God say about your heart this morning and you being before Him today? And how are you getting ready for heaven? You see, that's His great interest, is helping you and helping me be ready to see Him in heaven after He saves us in this beautiful picture of sanctification in the process. Well, that's not a lot of empty talk. That is full of substance. So whether it's the high intelligentsia or whether it's the, the really heretical or divergent teaching, and it can even be said forcefully, it can be said emotionally, but it has a lot to do with you be a better you and today is your day and you, know, you, you can have a better life. And that whole picture that really is not based thoroughly in the whole counsel of God's Word. Empty talkers. How about this? Deceivers. This week I read about a guy who's on the television in the name of Jesus, and he believes that God has led him to buy a $57 million dollar private jet. And this will be his sixth jet. And does it unabashedly in the name of Jesus. Now, friends, we, we need to begin to realize that deceivers are are really able in this. You know, you look at it and you go, oh, I would catch it. I would know it in a heartbeat. I wouldn't fall for that. You know, whatever it may be. 
But no, friends, we can, good people, even sometimes thinking people, can be drawn in when they are not grounded in the whole counsel of God's Word and sometimes in the serrated edge of God's Word. And so the serrated edge is necessary to expose them. And so they're called deceivers. This means they're not truthful. This means they're misleading. And we're going to see next weekend, why do they do this? We'll look at the motivations of that. But, and then we see this generalization that is made. The first one is, that especially of the circumcision party. Well, you, some of you are wondering, okay, they're talking about knives and circumcision. Wow, that's interesting. No, that, that, not in relationship here. I, I want you to say the circumcision party is the, the people that are saying, hey, we're Jews, and if you want to have Christ, you have to first become a Jew because Jesus was Jewish. I mean, we told you all that we're the chosen people, and now it's really proven. Jesus came. He rose from the dead. So they would preach Christ, but they would also say, if you're not Jewish in ethnicity, if you're not Jewish in where you come from, you have to first become Jewish, and then you can become really a Christian. That's the idea. You have to be circumcised and you have to abide by these feasts, and you have to observe these ceremonies, and you have to engage in the Jewish law, which, of course, is completely contrary to the gospel of God's grace. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, the law is done. It's not that the law is not needed, but the law has been fulfilled in me. You come to me, and if you come to me and you live in me, you can ultimately fulfill the law because your faith is in me. I have fulfilled the law. And so you are made right with the law through the grace and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, these people are adding to the work of Christ. And so they would come along and with their insubordinate, empty talk, deceiving, especially those of the circumcision party, this is what they would do. Now, I want you to notice something here that's really important. Pagan prophets, so these are not people from a godly background, pagan prophets deceiving God's people are offensive to God. So when the prophets of Baal try to deceive the, the, the nation of Israel, that's not a good thing, and that's offensive to God. When people from the outside are coming along, when, let's fast forward to where we are today, it's, it's people from out in secular society. It's people that are part of the Darwinianists, and the people are the ones who reject the law of God, the moral law of God, the nature of God, the nature of the Scripture. So, so perhaps anything from secular humanism that's seeking to deceive the church, that's offensive to God. But you know what really gets God? You know what He really condemns? Is when, look at this, look at the next line that is here. It's when God's prophets are deceiving God's people. That is horrible to God. One is, one is offensive, but there's degrees in this. And once it becomes horrible, then we see. And we see this in Jeremiah 23, and I think it's important enough for you uh, to include it on the outline. Notice what it says in verse 13. Moreover, among the prophets of Samaria, so these were sellouts. These weren't people that were holding on to the law. These were people who had really embraced pagan religions around them. These were not the Jewish leaders. These were not truly the Jewish people. Look what it says. Moreover, among the prophets of Samaria, I saw at circle it offensive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. Verse 14. Also among the prophets of where? Jerusalem. So we're not talking about the half-breed Samarians. We're talking about the purest, the ones that are supposed to have it right. The prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a, circle it, horrible thing. The committing of adultery in walking in falsehood. So these prophets of Jerusalem are not godly men. They're committing adultery, and whether it's adultery toward other gods or whether it's adultery toward even in their own familial circumstance, either way we see that they're not faithful men. Walking in what? Falsehood. And they strengthen the hands of what? when they're supposed to be strengthening the hands of God's people, but they strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one has turned back from his wickedness. All of them have become to me like Sodom and her, inhabitant, and her inhabitants like Gomorrah. You see, this is despicable 
before God. We looked at the book of Jude, and you can, you can fill this in here as well. The most dangerous attacks are not from the outside, but from where? The inside. Satan's most clever attacks in Satan's long-term game is to corrupt churches from the inside, not the outside. Notice in Jude chapter 12, um, all the way to 19, this is, this is a, an amazing picture, and I, I just want to read the first couple of verses that are here. Look at Jude chapter 12. It's on the screen in front of you. We studied the book of Jude. Some of you will remember this. These, so these deceivers, these bad leaders are called hidden reefs. You remember that? Remember we talked about hidden reefs? What's a hidden reef? You know, you're sailing along off the coast of Florida, and you don't see a reef that's there. Um, and so you're sailing along, and the reef that's hidden, suddenly you run into that reef, and it rips a huge hole in the bottom of your ship, and your ship is lost because it hit a hidden reef. Well, these guys are hidden reefs at your love feast. As they feast without fear, and here they are, shepherds feeding themselves. What are shepherds supposed to do? They're supposed to feed the sheep, but they're feeding themselves. And he gives another comparison. They're waterless clouds swept along by winds. Here's another one. They're fruitless trees in late autumn. Late autumn is when everything's supposed to be really bearing fruit. Here they are. They're fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Verse 13, they're wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their shame. They're wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. This is a massive serrated statement of their doom. He's saying that these false leaders are going to get it, and they're going to get it forever. He's saying that when you defy the words and the truth of God, and you lead people astray, or you follow in with that, here's the picture, this is not going to go well for your eternity. And so we see, I mean, in the rest of Jude, we see a, a, an intense serrated edge. Now, I want you to see this as well as we wrap up. In verse 12, we see, in verse really 11 is where you see part of it, and then we go over into verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars. Evil beasts, lazy, lazy gluttons. Now, here's what Paul does in his serrated edge. He uses a quote from one of Crete's own philosophers. And so, everyone would have known Epimenides. Everyone would have known what he said. In fact, he just, he just quotes him. He's not, he's not saying, look, I said this. He's using something saying, look, it's known to everyone that these people have a hard time living righteously and telling the truth. And, and I want you to give, I want to give you a little bit of insight about this. Where was Crete? Where was it? It's in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now, you would say, well, an island, that's pretty good. They're insulated from all the bad stuff around them. They can have their own thing. No. An island is a considered, a, it's a transit place. That means people are sailing in, stopping, being there for a little bit, resupplying a little bit, and then they're sailing out, going on to where they're supposed to go, where they're, wherever it is that they need to go. It's, it's, they would sail to Crete. It would, commerce would just flow through Crete. Sailors would flow through Crete. And if you, if you remember Crete as being that way, and if you look at Corinth, there's a reason that Corinth had a lot of people passing through it because of where it was located. And so when you see these transit cities, or in this case, a transit island, you see that people are away from home, they're away from their families, they're on the, the, there are people who li make their living traveling and doing all of these things, and so there's not the accountability of their own village. There's not the accountability of their own life. And so they come in with different ideas, they come in with different desires, and they live in that way. And the Cretans go through centuries and centuries and centuries of living like that. And in fact, some of you 
and you remember this more in the olden days of traveling maybe here in America, um, before the great big rest areas and all of that. Back in the day when you would travel, if your car had trouble and you were coming along and you were by a, a big highway and you were from out of town and you went to a garage because it's overheating or the fan belt broke or this happened or that happened, what are you worried about? This guy is, this, this is going to possibly what? Rip me off, right? Because there's no real accountability. You're not, you're not from there. It's not like you're related to his aunt's mother's cousins. You know, I mean, he has less accountability. And so as, as people who would, and there's even businesses and so forth we would say in, the, in days gone by, well, that guy's not very honest. He's out there by the highway. I remember in St. Augustine, there was, a, there was a garage that was out by I-95, and I remember being there, and I remember it did not have a good reputation in town. If you had to have something done, you didn't go there because you knew that those guys were rather unscrupulous, and people off I-95 constantly got, well, that is the reputation of the Cretans. They are people who would take advantage. They are people who would come, and they, they, they were just known. In fact, they were so much so Throughout the Roman Empire, people would say, well, the guy's a Cretan. Well, he, he may be a Turk, or he may be from Jerusalem, or he may be somewhere, but he acts like a Cretan. I mean, that was the reputation that they had. And so that generalization was something that was the environment that the church was trying to survive in. And so people were coming out, they, they should have been coming out of the world of the Cretan uh, culture in coming to the gospel. But if you don't have the gospel in the center of the church, then all you get is more Cretan culture. You're just bringing the Cretan culture into the church. Now, friends, I want to say to you that we are in danger of that here in this time, in this place, in this church. If all of the worldliness of South Florida and all of the transit nature of South Florida makes its way into the heart of our morality and makes its way into the heart of our values and makes its way into the heart of who we are either as individual Christians or as a church family, then we have just become like the world. And we see that Paul is coming against that. You see, transit cities are not known for virtue. They're known for vice. And the Cretan people were really having to deal with that. And so here we see the Apostle Paul devotes a whole letter to that to straighten it out. Now, here's some application. We're going to move very fast. Here's the application for our church and for our lives. Number one, we need to recognize that God's truth is not subtle, nuanced, or a feel-good message. God's Word, God's truth is not a subtle, nuanced, feel-good message. It is very direct and it is, it is often cutting deep to the bone. Underneath that, you can say, this is a holy God confronting and saving a sinful people. This is a holy God. Why does it have to have a serrated edge sometimes? Why is the message so intense? Because this is a holy God saving a sinful people. Look at number two. The greatest attack on the church is always on its message to its people. That is the attack on the church. The greatest attack is not from the outside. It's not the new laws on the outside. It's the holiness on the inside. And it's the purity of the gospel and the doctrine on the inside. Look at number three. False church leaders have been a problem from the start. We need to recognize that. This is coming from the first century in Crete, and it's true all the way through Christian history. We saw that in Jude. We see that in James. We see that throughout the rest of our studies of the New Testament. The church has always dealt with false leaders, and so we have to be careful to deal with it correctly. This is a massive problem today. Number four, the church must only recognize as, as its leaders men who live and teach God's truth. Both living it and teaching it is absolutely essential. Number five, the pastors and elders must do battle with those who deny, dilute, or dilute, or denigrate the gospel either in word or in deed. 
That is, the, that is the call that we see here. Titus is saying, you have to go silence them. You have to deal with them. You have to confront them. And you have to remove them. So that is what, that's what pastors and elders must do. So the church needs to recognize leaders that live and teach. The elders, the leaders that live and teach, must continue to protect the church. And the final thing is, number six, the serrated edge of the gospel will offend, but it will also save. The serrated edge of the gospel will offend, but it will also save. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but what? a sword. He came to cut. He came to show. He came to show the need for God. And so he cuts down into our hearts. He cuts down into our thinking, and he shows us our need for him. And in 1 Peter, we see this beautiful picture that either Jesus to you and his words are a stumbling block. And I, I want you to see this passage Notice it's on the screen in front of you, and, and with this we close. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 um, through 7, really, it says, For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in, believes in him will not be what? If you believe in him, you're not going to be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. You see, Jesus, in all of his message and all of his truth, and all of the grace that he would use to show us who, he, who we are and who he is, is either a stumbling block that is to be rejected, or he is the cornerstone by which we are saved. Would you stand with me for prayer?